Okay, why don't we get started? Um, it's going to be a busy day today. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of you know that the uh, Center for Memory and Protein Research over at the Health Sciences Center is having their annual meeting this afternoon and then tomorrow afternoon. And so you get points for to going at least for one of those talks and writing it up. And so that'll be called Exercise 3. And uh, so uh, that's in the academic classroom building. So I don't know how familiar you are with the medical school, uh, you know, between, uh, let me just sketch it out here. Let's see if I can like this. So if this is uh, Indiana, Indiana, okay, and the medical, so this is uh, east, go that way, we're over here, across the railroad tracks, we go over to Indiana, there's a bridge that goes over to Marshall Sharp, which brings you on to Indiana, so then this is the medical school, and the hospital is on the south side, that's the park, uh, facing towards 19th Street. The medical school is on the other side, and it has really basically two parts that sort of project out, and this part has that the DNA symbol on it. Okay, that's where the patient stuff is, and then there's a, a covered drop-off area for patients, and then there's another big piece that juts out, and that's the academic classroom building. And um, you, you can park in um, patient parking as long as you don't have a TTU, TTU HSC sticker. So uh, employees can't park there, but you can. And so there's a parking lot right there. And so if you go into this door, the first floor is where all the big lecture halls and where they'll, they'll have that meeting. So the, you'll see signs to it, but it's usually about halfway down this hall, and it's a big, massive um, lecture hall. And so that starts, starts when? Um, welcoming is at, at 2 o'clock. And then the, the keynote speaker um, is Ernie Wright from UCLA Medical School, whose laboratory I worked next door for five years when I was a postdoc, so I know him quite well. And we're going to talk about one of the proteins that he's going to speak about uh, today. So um, that would be a really good way to learn the, the latest stuff on that, that protein. Okay, so that's it. Yes? No. You need to report on one talk. So you get to choose. What I would do is I would pick a couple that interest you um, and then look at both of them. And because some of them are so complicated, you won't be able to write much about it. I don't know if you found Dr. Ortiz complicated, but you know, it, some of those are really pretty wild. And sometimes they don't talk, they don't have the best English, and so they're, you know, so it's, you get to pick which one you talk about. Dr. Wright, of course, is, is famous for the sodium glucose co-transporter. He's a very good speaker. He's actually British. Uh, I always used to try to get him to say the word capillary because he pronounces it capillary. And so he never knew that. I said, how does the blood get into the renal tubule? He said, by the capillary. Uh, oh. <laughs> that was fun. So I, I probably won't play that game with him today. Um, so you get to choose, and it's this afternoon. There's actually a poster session and heavy hors d'oeuvres after that. You're welcome to come. You do not need to sign in. Or they might have you sign in, but there's no, there's no uh, uh, registration. It's free for you guys. Uh, you will not be signing in. I certainly won't be sticking my clicker thing to their podium. So you give me a report. That's how I, I know you, you will attend it. So. And then tomorrow it's the same deal in the afternoon from about, let's see, uh, it's, it runs from 130 to 530. So there's several different talks. And if you haven't seen this, it's on our website under Cell Relevant Seminars. You can click on that and see this page about which talks there are. So I hope some of you will go. OK, so we're talking about transport, which is the whole, uh, which is going to be the talk uh, over at the medical school, various proteins. Unfortunately, um, I didn't bring my laptop, so this is, I'm going to have to switch back and forth today between the, uh, the outline and the, the PowerPoint. So we've been talking about uh, 
the, this is our poster child family. There's like five different members that we've spoken about. And so these are all uniports. It's facilitated diffusion. And so you have transporters, and then you have channels that are in this facilitated diffusion category. Right now, we're fo focusing on transporters. And so we need to talk about the mechanism by which it gets glucose across a membrane. Every cell has a glucose transporter. Okay? It's all that, that mediates the diffusion of glucose down a chemical gradient. So if you look at the, the PowerPoint, this is where we were last time. Uh, different isoforms have different affinities, and we talked about why those affinities make sense in terms of what, uh, how, uh, how high the affinity needs to be to get glucose to come into cells. Okay. All right, so this is basically the, the idea. This is called the alternating conformation model, and the reason it's called that is in one conformation, known as the T1 conformation, transporter 1, it faces the extracellular space and it has a very high affinity for glucose. Glucose binds, the stoichiometry for the glute family is one glucose, not two, as is shown here. So there's a lot of bogus figures in this chapter, and this is one of them. You don't need two, two glucose molecules, you just need one, okay? And when that binds to this high affinity site, what it's gonna do is it's gonna alter its compound, it's gonna actually refold and face the interior of the cell. And because it loses affinity for the glucose, there'll be a net transport of glucose in this one direction. Okay. And so the only way it can do this, what, what's the driving force? It's the chemical potential for glucose. It has to be higher outside the cell than inside. Okay. And then, so the, the actual uh, more detailed mechanism is shown on this. That it's annotated here. Glucose hops on. It refolds from the T1 to the T2 conformation. So now the glucose is facing the cytoplasm. This is a low affinity site, so it, it diffuses, dissociates off. And then it slowly refolds back to the T1 um, conformation. This is the rate limiting step, is the slow refolding back to the, the T1. That's what's, it's slow because it's not activated by the solute um, coming on and, and, and refolding. So this is the rate limiting step. This, uh, this particular step. Okay, so that's the mechanism, and um, what we want to do is complete these categories of transporters, and then actually, um, you know, have poster children for each one of these. And then we're gonna we're gonna put all of these into an actual cell type that does something useful and is medically uh, interesting. So that's where we're headed today. And the oh, one thing you do need to know is you you need to start. Um, building a, a sort of a toolkit like we, we did for membrane fluidity. In this case, what's really useful are certain types of drugs. I'm not talking about recreational drugs. These are drugs that you can use to inhibit or activate uh, a set of different proteins. Now, the, the drug that will inhibit the glute family, all five members, actually all 12 members, is um, it's actually a I think it's a mushroom toxin known as cytochalasin cytochalasin B. Let's see, I think that's probably. Let's get out of this. And go back to the outline. So for uh, let's go back down here. No, that's not. There. Um, And it's good to keep a list of these so that you can use them uh, if you need to, to dissect out what kind of um, ion, ion, ion transport or solute transport protein. So cytochalasin B, okay? And that's a specific toxin for, uh, and at least at low doses, it's a very specific toxin for the glute family. And what it actually does is when that off, off, alternating conformation occurs from T1 to T2, the, the drug uh, grabs it and locks it permanently into the T2 position so it can't refold to the outside. That's how cytoplasm B works. So it locks it into the T2 conformation. And you have to be able to alternate, otherwise you shut down the function of those transport. So this is a really valuable uh, tool to have in your tool. Now we're going to switch gears and move from passive over to active transport. And 
Um, we'll start with probably the best, the best known member of this family. Uh, let's look briefly at the, the outline. There's several different classes of ATPases, okay? And we'll talk about the P class ATPase family, the F, the F type family, and the ABC uh, super family, which is the largest set of genes for uh, pumps. So these are all, so they're in the, the category of active, and within active you've got primary and secondary. Since these are actually binding and splitting ATP, they're primary active transporters. And so we would call them all pumps, okay? With a couple of weird exceptions, okay? So the first one is called the P class ATPase family, uh, mainly because it, gets, it phosphorylates itself during the transport cycle. And if you went to um, Dr. Ortigas' uh, lecture last Wednesday, uh, the sodium pump is a classic member where it phosphorylates itself in order to change conformations. So uh, the best understood family or family member is actually the calcium ATPase. Uh, it also is, it goes by the name CERCA, which is smooth uh, ER calcium ATPase. This, can, this actually lives in the, the endoplasmic reticulum and out, also it's on the surface of the membrane in the plasma membrane. So it, it can exist in both places. The hallmark is the transport machine, the catalytic part, is 8 to 10 transmembrane alpha helices. And that makes sense with our rule. All of these transport mechanisms are going to involve at least multiple transmembrane um, uh, alpha helices. Or there's always multiple. They happen to use 8 to 10 of these. All right. So uh, let's go into some of the detail for that. Okay, so we're talking about pumps that actually bind ATP. Sometimes they phosphorylate the, themselves, as they do in the P class. Other times they do not. So that's not somehow it's going to it's going to break that ATP to cause a, a conformational change. Okay, um, so we're talking about this phenomenon right here. Yeah. And again, what this, you want to ask yourself: What kind of solutes? Um, What's the energy that's driving this, and what is the, what's the, the pump mechanism look like? Uh, these tend to be ions that are moved by these pumps, and in fact, all the ones that we'll, we'll talk about except for the ABC transporter family are ions. So the first one's going to be taking calcium and moving it against its electrochemical gradient. Calcium has a, a valence of what? Plus two? And so we're going to actually be moving this against the electrochemical gradient. Not just the chemical concentration of, cal of calcium, but the electrical gradient. Okay? So uh, it turns out the, if you look at the kinetics, it's going, to be, it's going to saturate like this. It will follow classic Michaelis-Menten kinetics. It will be much faster than simple diffusion, which is a straight line. Okay? So it's going to look like that curve there. All right? And Again, there's three classes of pumps. We've talked about that. So here's a picture of the of circa, and let's get the location in the cell. Location is always important for the function of whatever protein we're talking about. We already know this. So this is this is the lumen of the ER. Okay, um, it was actually probably originally described in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. People who study muscle call call everything sarco. Okay, so it's not the endoplasmic reticulum; it's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's where that name comes from to um, to indicate that it's in a muscle cell, a sarcomere. All right. So, but you can read it as the ER. All right. So this is the ER, and here's a little trick: when all the, when you put the pump in the membrane, you need to get the orientation correct. And here's the the key to getting it right: the ATP binding domain must face the cytoplasm. And that makes a lot of sense because that's where the ATP concentration is. It's high, right? So that means this nucleotide binding domain, which is going to be the domain that latches on to the energy source, which is ATP, faces the cytoplasm. Okay? And then the rest of this is oriented in the, uh, this direction. So those 8 to 10 transmembrane alpha helices are located here because they go in and out, in and out, in and out, and span the membrane. This is the lumen of the ER. It has a very high calcium concentration. That's because its job is to take excess calcium out of the cytosol and pack it into the lumen. It's a storage site. So calcium concentration is high in two locations. 
outside the cell, in your blood, it's like 2.5 millimolar. Okay? What is it on the inside of the cell? It's like 100 nanomolar, 0 0.1 micromolar. So this is a huge 10 to the fourth chemical potential difference between the outside and the inside. And that same chemical potential difference exists here. Very low, it's like 0 0.1 micromolar. Okay? Here it's 2 millimolar, it's huge. So that means if you're going to move this ion into uh, the lumen of the ER, you're going to have to push it with energy. And we get that energy from breaking ATP. Okay. So what happens is uh, in all of these uh, P-class pumps, and usually in most all of the, the pumps that, that are ATP aces, the ATP is loosely bound to the nucleotide binding domain all the time. Okay, it's always, and the reason for that is ATP is so high. If there is a nucleotide binding domain, it will be occupied by ATP. But that's not what causes this pump to do its job. What happens is, this is loaded onto the nucleotide binding domain, it's just resting, it's just open, like this. So this is the binding site for the calcium. It's the binding of the calcium, and it's, the stoichiometry is two calciums, two calciums load onto the calcium binding site, that's what tells the pump to split the ATP. What does it do with that ATP? It takes a gamma phosphate, the third phosphate, rips it off and sticks it onto, not a serine, not a threonine, not a tyrosine, but a very weird, weird amino acid, aspartate. So that's very unusual. This is not a typical regulatory phosphorylation event. This is a transport phosphorylation. So it, it actually forms a covalent bond with aspartic acid. So now it's got this, it's bristling with these negative charges and that shoves the protein into a new conformation. That conformation is, this is the E1, the inward facing uh, conformation facing the cytosol. That phosphorylation and the, that you put that phosphate onto this phosphorylation domain, that shifts it from the E1 to the E2 conformation. And what that does is it exposes the calcium binding sites to the interior of the ER. The ER lumen is now facing the calcium binding sites. When it achieves this new, so it's sort of refolding like the glute transporter, it refolds uh, the binding sites for the calcium, the reason it actually diffuses out away from the pump is that these, are, these have low affinity for calcium. They had high affinity in the E1 state, but when they refold it, they change their affinity. They said, I don't want you anymore. That's how it's able to let go of the calcium, even though collisions with the calcium are, high, are occurring at a very rapid pace, okay? So you would think that the, the pump would go this way, but it, it can't because those are high, uh, they're low affinity binding sites. The calcium comes off, okay? It's the dissociation of the calcium into the lumen that causes that phosphate to be clipped off. So it dephosphorylates itself. So this is really a kinase and a phosphatase all wrapped up in one, okay? So what does it do? It, it dephosphorylates itself after the calcium is released, and that's what reconfigures it back from the E2 conformation back to the E1. Okay? So the empty uh, pump refolds and faces the cytoplasm all over again. Okay, so real briefly, uh, let's go through this again. ATP is always bound. The calcium binds to the calcium binding sites. That tells the pump, do your thing. It phosphorylates itself, and uh, it, it releases the AT ADP immediately. But the phosphate is actually covalently stuck on to the protein. That causes this to shift from an E1 conformation. Those negative charges cause the protein to quiver and refold. And then those calcium binding sites now face the inside of the ER lumen. It releases the calcium. Again, when you release positive charges, how many charges are being released? Four positive charges. That's going to change the conformation. What does it do in response to the release of these four charges? It clips that phosphate off. It activates the phosphatase activity. And it is the release of that phosphate that causes it to refold back to the original conformation. So, 
Is this a uniport, simport, or any kind of co-transporter? There's only one solute being moved. Actually, some uh, biochemistry textbooks that don't know anything about transport would call this a uniport. I do not. Do not make that mistake. Pumps are in a class by themselves. They are not uniport, simport, antiport, any kind of port. Okay? It doesn't matter, you know, so the stoichiometry here is important because of how much charge is being moved. Okay? The, uh, this is actually, the, in, the inside of this is, is positively charged, so you're, you're working against an electrical gradient and you're working against a chemical gradient. Uh, what this does is this is this is electrogenic. It's actually moving charge because there's no counter ion going with it. So you're having to shove it against the electrical gradient and you're having to go uphill in terms of the calcium. So this is doing a lot of work. Okay. Uh, the reason the cell is very fastidious about keeping the calcium concentration low is that high calcium is used as a signal, a very brief signal to tell the cell to change its function. If this is a muscle cell, that little pulse in calcium contracts your muscles. That's what causes skeletal muscle contraction. Does it leave it there? Absolutely not. As soon as it, it spikes, it pulls that calcium right back in. Calcium at high concentrations is lethal to the cell. In fact, if it sees that signal stay on, it tells the cell to, to commit apoptosis. It kills itself. Okay? You do not want that calcium high in the cytoplasm for other than brief pulses. Okay. All right, questions about how this thing works. So this is called circa. Okay. Now, is there, uh, can we add a toxin or some kind of drug to inhibit this thing? Absolutely. It's probably the ugliest word I've ever seen used to describe a drug. Let's see if this is going to work. I guess not. Okay. Okay, it's a, a chemical called thapsigarbine. Sounds like a, you know, I don't know what it sounds like. Uh, thapsigarbine. So this is a compound, in, uh, when it's used about, well, it's very specific and very potent. Um, one nanomolar is enough to completely block. So if you want to see if the circa pump is, is involved in whatever you're studying, throw that in there. Does it stop what you're studying or does it not have any effect? This will stop circa from operating. Okay. Now, I said this operates over here in the um, uh, ER. The other place you find it is in the plasma membrane, where it's called just called a calcium ATPase. Okay. So here's a cell. This is the plasma membrane. How are we going to orient this pump into the plasma membrane? Using that rule, that little trick I told you. We're going to, so here it is in the ER, right? We're pumping calcium in this way. Right? This, the lumen of the ER is the exoplasma compartment. It is homologous to the outside of the cell. So if we put the calcium ATPase, where would the ATP binding domain be? And it'd be here, right? Because this is where ATP is being sucked into this thing. And then, the, so which way is the calcium going to go? It's going to be driven outside of the cell to the extracellular space. And then it's going to uh, accelerate with your blood, which has a high, has a reasonably high calcium compared to the uh, cytosol. So you know, this is uh, 0.1 micromolar calcium. This is 2.0 millimolar huge difference. Okay. Now, what did I say is the standard membrane potential inside of the cell? Outside is, is always what? Outside is always taken to be ground, zero. Okay. The inside is always an resting Joe Blow cell. Negative, and what's the typical membrane? Minus 60. Okay, so it's minus 60. Okay. That means that the outside of the cell, which is zero, is 60 millivolts more positive than the inside of the cell. So you're having to push calcium 
against a huge electric vehicle gradient. Now, students some sort of, sometimes they get confused. They go, well, it's zero outside the cell. No, it's the difference across the membrane. Okay, so the outside is actually plus 60 if the inside is considered zero. But that's not how we do things. The outside zero, you're minus 60, so you're pushing against plus 60 millivolts to get it to go outside. Plus, you're pushing against this huge chemical difference. So that's why you need to split the ATP. And this is electrogenic, okay? So when this thing operates, what is it going to do to the membrane? You're at minus 60, and now, now we're going to turn the switch, and the calcium ATPA starts moving. What happens to the membrane potential? Does it become more negative or more positive? Well, our rule is N minus out, right? So how many charges are coming in? Zero. Okay. Minus what's going out? Minus two, right? So this is hyperpolarizing the cell membrane. It's making it less likely to become active. If this is an excitable muscle cell, it's actually hyper. We call that. So this is going to go from minus 60 to some, let's just say, what are minus 80. Okay? It's going to make it, it's, it's going to hyperpolarize the membrane and make it less excitable. Because right? you're pushing two positive charges out, that means it's the same as bringing two negative charges in. So this makes the cell less likely to create an action potential if you were using uh, excitable cells. Now, not all cells are excitable. Not all cells can create an action potential. But you can depolarize and hyperpolarize a cell. And in general, in cell physiology, hyperpolarization turns cells off. Depolarization, making them more positive on the inside, turns them on. And that's a good rule. Can we get rid of it? Yes? Does that pump on a plasma membrane have the same stoichiometry as the circuit pump? It's the same protein. Okay, so would it be like two positive cells? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So it's a total of four <laughs> positive charges. Yeah, so if you were, so I really want to say it's zero and four out, right? It's two. And each one of those ions carries two, uh, plus two valence. So the, and that charge movement for one cycle of the calcium ATPase is four positive charges being expelled. And that's going to hyperpolarize the inside of the cell. All right. Any questions about that? This is the simplest case. This is as simple as it gets. Okay. So that's why we start. Yeah. Does that target? Just the calcium ATPase. Yeah. Okay. That guy off. Come back. Sure. Maybe this is. All right, be that way. All right, I don't know. All right, let's see. Let's now let's go to a slightly more complicated version. I have no idea why this center thing is not working, but let's try center. <coughs> Okay, I guess we're limited to this thing. Okay, um, let's talk about uh, Dr. Artigas' um, research protein. Okay, now, uh, one good thing to do while you're looking at these different diagrams is to figure out whether they're a good representation of the protein or what's wrong with it. In this case, this textbook, one of the reasons we used to use it, one of the reasons, oh, it's coming back, okay. One of the reasons that we quit using it is a lot of the diagrams are very inaccurate and it's misleading to the students. Okay, so the way the sodium pump uh, sits in cells and all animal cells have sodium pumps, right? The reason that the sodium pump is so important is that 50% of the energy you're using as you sit there is going to run this pump. That's how much of your energy is being used to run this pump. Because this sets up all the ion gradients to run all the other pumps. 
okay? Uh, and uh, transporters, okay? So the way it is, is it is a heterotetramer typically, not always, but heterotetramer. It has a uh, alpha and a beta subunit and two copies of each. The alpha subunit is eight to 10 membrane spanning alpha helices. So that means this thing is the transporter, that's the second transporter. They do not operate together. It only takes one alpha subunit to, to do all of the transport. We don't know if they, they are coupled in their motion or one works and then the next. It doesn't matter. They are quite capable. If you, if you just express this thing by itself, it will split ATP and move three uh, sodiums outside the cell and it will take two potassiums and bring it in. Okay? So you only need one copy of the alpha subunit to do its job. How many Alpha helices does it have? 8 to 10, because it's a P-class pump, right? Now, it has this beta subunit. The beta subunit is actually a single-pass membrane protein. So what's wrong with this figure? It doesn't go across the plasma membrane, does it? It's crap. <laughs> this, is a, this is a bogus figure, right? Okay, so uh, it is, you know, glycosylated. The role of the, the beta subunit appears to be in assembly and targeting. Because where you put this is only one place. It doesn't go to the ER, it doesn't go to the Golgi. It goes through all of those, but its final destination is always the plasma membrane. Okay? It lives in the plasma membrane. All right, so let's simplify this a little bit and consider. So it's going to take three sodiums and expel them, and then in return it's going to um, take two potassiums and bring it in, okay? And it's going to split one molecule of ATP. So how does it do that? Okay, so this is the, the transport cycle. And we start at the top, uh, and even though it shows both alphas are sort of holding on to the sodiums, that's not what it looks like. Okay? That's not how it happens. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll, I can show you a video here in a little bit. That, uh, it's a little bit better than this one. So we start in the E1 conformation. That's where it's, it's going to pick up ATP. And so unlike this picture, it doesn't show ATP bound. It starts in the E1 conformation with ATP loosely bound. It's already bound to ATP. Why? Because ATP is high in the cytoplasm. And the nucleotide binding domains, these little tips here, face the cytoplasm. So it's already got ATP there, loaded. What tells the pump to start its cycle? It's the same thing that told Circa to do its cycle. It's the binding of sodium, three sodiums, three high affinity binding sites. These have to be high affinity because the sodium concentration inside of cells is very low. You always keep sodium low inside of cells. And the thing that keeps it low is this machine right here. Okay. So this is about 10 millimolar. What's the concentration of sodium in your blood? It's the same as the extracellular space, approximately. 120, 130. So it's about a tenfold difference in concentration. Okay. So it's going to be fighting against a concentration gradient to go out. Is it fighting against an electrical gradient? It's the same thing as it was for calcium, right? It's minus, if it's minus 60 in here and zero out there, that means it's 60 millivolts more positively charged on the outside of the cell. And you're trying to take three positive charges and shove it against that electrical potential. So it's got to face both an electrochemical and a chemical potential difference. And to do that, it's going to split ATP. That's how it's going to get its energy. Okay? So it binds to these three. Uh, binding sites facing the cytoplasm in the E1 conformation, okay, and then that tells it to split the ATP. So it splits the ATP that was bound to these nucleotide binding domains, splits it, okay, it releases the ADP. Where's the phosphate? Stuck on an aspartate. It's the same deal. It's, it phosphorylates an aspartate um, amino acid. So it phosphorylates itself. What does that cause it to do? It refolds from the E1 to the E2 conformation. Okay. Now, why is that important? Because when it faces outside here, 
the concentration was sodium. Sodium is going to try to collide to those sodium binding sites. But they have extremely poor affinity for sodium. So what happens? The sodium dissociates to the outside, and this is incapable of taking them up. Unless, I mean, every once in a while it would happen, right? Okay. So this is, this is now in the empty state. It's the release of that, that sodium that allows the potassiums to bind. Now, it has low affinity for sodium, but it's got two binding sites now for potassium, two high affinity binding sites. That's because potassium in your blood is low. What, do we have any medically knowledgeable people? What's your, what's your blood potassium? It's highly regulated, by the way, isn't it? Very highly regulated. You go into shock if you move that number around. It's like three or four millimolar outside the cell. What's it on the inside? 70 millimolar. So you're pushing against an electrical gradient. I mean, I'm sorry, a chemical gradient. <coughs> what about the electrical component? Right. So it's, it's actually getting a free ride in terms of the electrical potential. Okay? Because... This is actually more negative. It's, this is zero out here. That's minus 60 on the inside. And so that's going to actually help pull the... It actually, what it does is the, the leaving... This is from Dr. Ortega's lecture. Uh, the, the dissociation of the sodium causes those positive uh, potassiums to be sucked on or electrophoretically moved into their binding pockets, which have a high affinity. So that's the, that's the negativity that's pulling them in. So... It's the binding of the potassiums that's going to do the next trick, which is to tell the pump to cut that phosphate. So it's the binding of the potassiums, not the dissociation of the sodium that tells the pump it's time to reconform from the E2 back to the E1. And so that's what it's going to do. It's going to reconform, refold from the E2 conformation back to the E1. Okay. And something, though, has to, it's sort of, it's, it's there, it's sort of open, but those Ks can't get out, okay? Until, this is from Dr. Ortega's lecture, until an ATP will actually bind to that nucleotide binding domain, and that's what causes the final release of potassium back into the cytosol. It's refolded into the E1, but the, the, the Ks, the potassiums, are still lodged on there. Okay. It binds ATP, that resets the pump to a full E1 confirmation. The potassiums leave, now you're ready to go for the next round. Okay. So it's just a little different because we're, we're doing you know, counter transport, three out, two in, three out. And so let's do that little exercise. Uh, let's, what does this pump do to the membrane potential, if anything? The question is, is it electrogenic? That's, that would be test question. And in what direction? Would it, if it is, what does it hyperpolarize? And you get used to these terms. Hyperpolarize means to make the inside more negative. Depolarize means to make it less negative. It doesn't have to become positive. It just makes it it's less negative or more negative than it was. So, so let's let's do the rule. So it's how many are coming in? Two minus three going out. So it's making it more negative on the inside, just like circa. Right? It's hyperpolarizing the cell. Okay. All right. Now, do we have any toolkit for this? Well, we actually have lots of tools, Doctor. Artigas uh, talked about a really interesting uh, toxin that's made by coral called palate toxin, but we're not going to, it actually turns this into a bizarre channel protein, which is strange. But anyway, so we'll forget about that. Uh, this is medically important. Uh, digitalis and a drug called Wabane are both, they both do the same thing. What they do, they're, they're plant sterols, I think, and what they do is they, they, uh, bind to the potassium binding sites and prevent the pump from refolding into the E1 position. 
So if potassium can't bind, then the pump is stuck. It's stuck in its little cycle. And let's see, do I have, let's go to the outline. Those should be there somewhere. Okay, must be, uh, I'll talk about them later. Okay, so Wabane, it, let me go ahead and spell them for you since you're, you're going to be writing this down. These compounds are called cardiac glycosides. And so, so you can think wabane is, is the sound of the drug hitting the sodium pump. Wabane. Right. I don't know if you remember it. Okay. Now, the other one is digitalis. Some of you may know that's used in heart patients. Let's think about that. What? That's actually a good exercise. Um, why would giving a, a heart person that's encountering heart failure so that the cardiac muscle is weak? It's not beating strong. Okay. Why would giving a person this a little bit of this drug to inhibit the sodium pump? Why would that make that patient's heart beat stronger? So think about this. So draw it. Okay. That's how you solve these problems. So now we're talking about a real cell with multiple transporters. And I just talked about two of the pumps that are involved in answering this question. So you're going to draw yourself. Put both of those pumps there and ask yourself, why are you, is that giving a patient that stuff? Why is that going to make their, their cardiac muscle contract harder? Think about that. I need to be growing. Or thinking about it. I just want to get, I want to get everybody a chance to do that. Okay, so let's, who has it? She said it. I think she said it's in the polarizing and activating system. It does, it does. And this, in a cardiac muscle cell, actually the actual potential is carried by calcium. <coughs> What, what works on circuit? That's a garden. It's like one of those transporters. I think they should name one of those transporter things in Japanese. Anyway, <coughs> fat is garden will be great. Anyway, so. so <coughs> right, you're not. You're, that, that's what, so what, what you're saying is so here's the sodium pump, and then but because you're not taking the sodium, and you're blocking this, right? That makes the membrane potential more positive, and that would that would lower the threshold for contraction. Okay, so that's one thing. That is that's a possibility. Okay, anything else? You said earlier that depolarization increases cell activity. Right. And so since inhibiting the pump gets rid of that hyperpolarization effect, that should have a Right. That causes this, right? It depolarizes, right? Okay, so we got that established. Yeah. So, is there any other thing that's happening? So, it consists. So, we have the let's put the ATP, the calcium ATPase. So, what is it doing? It's doing. Oh, you don't. You need another protein. So, at this point, that's actually the best answer. If you didn't know about this other protein, you need another um, protein, which is called calcium sodium amine. And this is a different type of protein altogether. It's a secondary active protein. Okay. And so I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, this is primary because it's splitting ATP. What this protein does is it takes three sodiums and it brings them in. Why, do, why are those three sodiums coming in? Because 
because the sodium pump has created an energy gradient to bring those in. So what it's going to do is it's going to use some of the energy of the sodium gradient to bring in sodium. And then in return, it's going to expel calcium. It's going to kick out one calcium for three sodium. So what is that doing for the membrane? Let, let's do it. So it's three in minus two out. So this is depolarized the cell, right? That depolarizes it anyway. Well, what it's doing is it's using the energy created by the sodium pump to explore the calcium. Because remember, the, the goal is to get calcium out of the cytoplasm. Okay. Um, but it's not a pump, though. Let's, let's make sure we, get, we know what it is. It's called a co-transporter. Okay. And specifically, since they're going in opposite direction, it's called an anti -port. So technically, this is a secondary active co-transport. Okay. That means two different solutes are coupled, the movement of two different solutes are coupled. And then the last, that doesn't completely describe this, we'd have to call it an antiport because the two solutes are going in different directions. Okay. okay, so now what's going to happen if we put Wabane here, our digitalis? And block that pump. What's going to happen to the sodium? Less calcium is going to leave the cell because there's going to be less of a sodium gradient. So, so this thing is depends on the fact that, that sodium is 10 millimolar. What's going to happen to this level when you put Wabe on that side? Go up or down? It's going to it's going to dissipate the sodium. So, so the sodium uh, concentration is going to go up. And that is going to block <coughs> this cell. Right? Because the way that angle is working is it's working off of the sodium gradient. It depends on the sodium gradient, which is slowly disappearing. Because you're, you're blocking this guy. It's keeping the sodium low. So now the sodium is going to rise, and that's going to prevent this thing from operating. And if you block one, you block the other because they're coupled. It depends on both of them to move. And that's going to do what to the concentration of calcium? If it's operating, it's expelling calcium. So the opposite is it keeps it in, as she said here. So the calcium concentration in response to the is going to go up, and that strengthens the contraction of the ventricular muscle. Because as you, some of you know, calcium is intimately uh, involved in contraction. And it is in the, your heart muscle and in your skeletal muscle. And actually even in the smooth muscle as well. So the idea is to keep more calcium in that cardiac, that cardiac myocyte and that strengthens the, the, the grip that that, um, muscle, that muscle cell has when it contracts. Okay. All right, so that inter that that got a little bit ahead of ourselves because I had introduced uh, secondary active. We have had that. Uh, let's take a break before we do the last. We have one other, a couple other types of ATPs, and then we'll go into secondary active. <coughs> So it can't release, you know. 
it, because it's got it's got all the calcium, and you've got to get rid of the calcium to go through the contraction cycle. Contract. It'll be good for contracting, but there's no way to relax. Exactly. That's, that's good. That would work. Uh, what is the potassium storehouse in the cell? Are there other like co transport that expel it? Now, what's, what's your question is, why is potassium high in the cell? Well, how is how does it not just like get so much potassium? Like, what what releases it in order? Oh, it to... yeah, we have another protein for that. Okay, we have a potassium channel that allows it to leak. Right, and so that actually was it was what generates most of that minus sixty millivolts. Okay. So we haven't gotten there yet. Right, but yeah. and there's another sodium as well that allows it to go into. Well. Um, it's, like it's actually well, the potassium goes in with sodium going out. Right. So it's not ex they're they're going in the opposite direction. Right. But uh, like you said, there's another another thing for potassium. There's another one for sodium. Oh, there's happens. other sodium channels. Right. There's potassium. There's chloride channels. Okay. So this is a really simplified version of what's actually there. okay. Okay. And so that's that's why it gets really interesting. Is you got to know how all of them work together. And then when we start talking about the intestine, they're all separate membranes, and that changes the function right. again. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You say the function of fish's house is to block the pump. It's the same as water. Okay. It, what it does is it occludes the potassium binding sites, so the potassium can't get on, and then freezes the pump in the two positions. Okay. Let's go ahead and get started again. And so this is where we are. P class, we finished that. Briefly, we're going to focus on this F type, and we're going to come back and hit it again when we get to the mitochondria. Because this, this is this class of ATPases is actually is run backwards to make ATP. So all of these, here's one really important concept to get straight. All of these transport processes are reversible. In other words, if we change the gradient, uh, then we can make the pump run backward or the, the transporter run backwards. If you take, if you split, if you uh, run the, the sodium pump backwards, that is, you drive sodium in and you expel potassium, you'll actually create ATP. It will take phosphate and ADP and put it together. And that's what this class of pumps does. 
It's called the F class because the, the, the founding member is called the FOF1 ATPase. That actually sits on your inner mitochondrial membrane. If you've had any kind of biology, you've seen this pump. It's called ATP synthase because its job is to basically synthesize ATP. It has huge eight or more subunits. This thing really had only one, the, the ATP, the uh, sodium and calcium ATPase only has one catalytic subunit. This one has eight to ten different proteins that are all working together to make ATP. Now, so let, it's actually better for me to, uh, we'll, we'll look at it briefly and then I'll draw it for you. Okay, so this is the, the ATP synthase, and let's get our heads around the orientation. So this is the inner this is the uh, intermembrane space. So that means the outer mitochondrial membrane is out here somewhere, right? With those porins and things. So the cytoplasm's out here. It, things like pyruvate and uh, various ions cross the outer membrane and they get into the inner membrane space, right? And then this is the inner mitochondrial membrane. That's the business end of your mitochondria that does all the work. Okay? This is where the uh, electron transport chain is located. And what is the electron transport chain actually doing? What is it actually doing? I mean, electrons are being fed to it from the TCA cycle. Okay? It's pumping hydrogens in which direction? Exactly. Okay, so what you, what you don't see here is the, the electron transport chain is located right here. It's a bunch of proteins. And so inside this, this is the, the, the old cytoplasm of that bacteria that we enslaved a billion years ago. Okay? And the TCA cycle is making NAD and FAD, FAD, NAD, and those are the electron transport carriers, and they deliver it to this membrane. And as those electrons are gradually passed from one complex to the next, it's extruding protons from here to there. So the concentration of protons is higher outside in the inner membrane space than it is on the inside of the mitochondria. Okay? So now you've created a source of energy, correct? You've got higher protons here and lower protons there. Uh, if you're moving protons without a counter ion, what kind of membrane potential are you generating? Let, let's pretend that this is a bacterial cell. That's the cytoplasm, and you've just expelled a proton. What is that doing to, is it hyperpolarizing or depolarizing the matrix? It's, high, it's making it exquisitely negative. Okay? And so that, so the negativity is going to try to suck those protons back into the matrix. The chemical difference, you've got, it's, a, ten, it's a, a single pH difference, which is tenfold uh, concentration in protons, is trying to force its way back in. So you've got an electrochemical huge driving force to blow a proton through this machine. So what happens is, this is the FO complex, this is the F1, that's why it's called the FOF1 ATPase, okay? So those protons are allowed to cross the membrane because the FO complex is like a proton channel. But here's the weird part. When those protons enter this channel, this FO complex, this thing starts to rotate. This is a turbine engine. Okay? And so those protons will bind here and rotate, and then they will be extruded into the matrix, but not before they've started this thing to physically spin. Okay? This thing is going to spin, and it's going to turn that little piston right there. It's really not more of a, it's more of an axle than it is a piston. So this little thing there is part of the F1 complex, and this is the ATPase. Except what you're doing is that you're running it backwards. You're taking a proton gradient, and you're expending the energy, and it's going to pick up ATP, I mean, pick up ADP and phosphate, and shoot them together, and create. ATP. So notice that if you dissipate the, the proton gradient, you create ATP. Can you run this backwards? Absolutely. You can make, you can deplete this of, of protons, and you can put higher levels of protons on this side. The protons will move in this direction because the F1 complex will split ATP. 
So this is quite capable of being an ATPase, splitting ATP and ejecting protons. But that's not how it works in you and I. What it does is it runs backwards. Your electron transport chain extrudes protons, builds up a high concentration in the inner membrane space. They run through the FO complex and spin it. That turns this axle and that changes the catalytic activity of this little uh, bell pepper up here, which is the F1 complex. The F1 complex grabs onto a phosphate and ADP and shoves them together and they catalytically form ATP, which you use to run everything else. Okay. So the only weird part about this is the, the nucleotide binding domain is facing, it, it doesn't break our rule, it's facing a cytoplasm, but it's facing a very special cytoplasm called the mitochondrial matrix. But that used to be the bacterial cytoplasm. Okay. Now, there's a, a, a sister protein to this in the same family. It's called, guess what, VOV1. And so you don't have to learn anything new, but they, we have that pump in our vesicles. That's why it's called, V stands for vesicle or vacuolar for plants. But we can call it vesicular ATPase, VOV1. And now let me diagram for you because it's actually running in the, the forward direction. In other words, it's splitting ATP and pumping protons out of the cytoplasm. So how's it going to work? Yeah. All right. So this one is the VOV1 ATPase. Okay. And again, it has the same deal, 8 to 10 to 11 subunits. It's very complicated. It's got a proton channel. It's got a catalytic domain. Okay. And how are we, we going to orient this inside the cell? Okay, so here's the cell. And let's take a real basic, let, let's, let's put it on the plasma membrane. Now, where do you think you're going to put the V1 catalytic domain? Which size of it? Which way is it going to be facing? It's going to run off ATP. So what's our rule for pumps? The V1 has to be facing, the bell pepper has to be facing inside. In order, so this is going to actually take, it's not going to create ATP. It's going to split ATP and make ADP and phosphate. Okay? And then the the VO domain is a transmembrane domain that is a proton channel. And what it will do is will eject protons into the extracellular cell. So this will keep, this will alkalinize your cytoplasm. It will cause the pH to go up, because you know pH and proton concentration are opposite of one another. Okay. So it acidifies the outside of the cell and keeps this, the pH, at appropriate level, which is 7.0. Now, let's, let's use what we know about circa, <coughs> orientation there, and let's put it in a, a, a vesicle. Let's create a huge vesicle, and let's put this same protein and orient it here in this vesicle, because that's what the V stands for, vesicular VOV1. Where is V1 going to be? Here or here? Or in the membrane or there? Yeah, it's going to be. It's going to be. It's got to be facing where the source of ATP is. The ATP is going to go there, and then the, so that's the that's act, so this is the the, the V V one. Sorry, I think I call it V one V O. The V O is the, the proton channel. So that's what has to be the, the transmembrane segment. So this is the V O, and so you're going to split ATP and you're going to take protons and drive them into the vesicular lumen. So you're going to acidify that vesicle. And the ER, and as you go from the ER to the Golgi to the vesicles, the acidity of the lumen gets, the pH drops because of this pump operating. So remember, this is homologous to the outside of the cell. And so what this pump is doing is getting, it's, it's decreasing the, uh, the pH inside the lumen uh, the vesicle and the outside of your cell, but that simultaneously elevates the pH in your cytoplasm to keep it a nice quality center. 
So again, this is V1 and this is the VO. It's oriented differently than in the mitochondria, but its job is to run for, in the forward direction, which is split ATP and shove protons against a very small chemical brain. Okay. We will get into the details of that machine. Actually, this is studied in detail by uh, uh, Dr. Bever over in biochemistry. And if you take biochemistry, he's actually very good and knows everything about that. Okay. Questions about that thing? We're, again, we're not going to talk about the details. It's just a, a cool little turbine that we will get to later. Okay, on to the last uh, segment. So let's let's go back to the outline just to make sure where we are. Okay, so this is the last family of pumps, and this is the most bizarre family because it does all kinds of different things. Okay, it, it's called the ABC superfamily of transporters, and it's that ABC stands for ATP binding cassette. So it's a, it's a sequence of amino acids that you find in the nucleotide binding domain that characterizes this family. So we call them ABC transporters. There's 90 genes in your genome that produce these this fam, um, family members. Okay? They do all kinds of things. Some of them transport um, solutes against uh, electrochemical gradients, so they are classic ATPase pumps. Some of them are ATP gated ion channel. So you really can't call them a transporter because they're either you have transporters and you have channels. If it's a channel, it's not a transporter and vice versa. So some of them are actually ATP. It's the ATP that's actually gating the opening and closing of the of the ion channel. So we'll talk about that. And then some of them, like those found in your pancreatic beta cells, are crucial for detecting your ATP levels and stimulating insulin secretion. They're actually regulatory proteins. So we'll look at the first two examples in some detail. Okay, so the hallmark of this family is that typically there are actually two different transmembrane domains. Each one of them have six alpha helices. So we, that's why you call them the membrane domains. Okay, And then there are two nucleotide binding domains. All right. So let's look at the, what this thing looks like. This is one of the best uh, characterized um, ABC transporters. It's called MDR1. It was the first one that was um, described in some detail. The reason it's been studied so much is because this cancer cells tend to overexpress it, so there's been lots of drugs developed to, to inhibit this pump. And I'll explain why here in just a minute. But let's, so the N terminus is in the cytoplasm. I said there's two membrane domains, each one having six alpha helices, so it has 12 transmembrane alpha helices. Where's the C-terminus going to be? It's got to be in the cytoplasm. So even number alpha helices starts in the cytoplasm, it's going to finish in the cytoplasm. Okay? And so it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the, it's got this intracellular loop that contains the nuclear, first nucleotide binding domain, and then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's a second nucleotide binding domain. Now, that nucleotide binding domain is the thing that, that contains the ATP binding cassette, the ABC. So let's, let's zoom in on that. This is the ATP binding cassette. That just means it's a stretch of amino acids that characterizes this protein. So this little sequence would be found in each one of those nucleotide binding domains. And they have three pieces. There's only two of them that are important. So it's got a walker A and a walker B sequence. And then it's got a linker, which we're not going to talk about. What is this walker A and walker B doing? Well, it must be doing something to cause ATP either to bind or to split. And it actually does both. Okay. So here's a, this is a molecule of ATP. Right? Here's adenine, this is the ribose, this is the alpha-beta-gamma phosphate. The Walker A motif job is to hold on to that gamma phosphate. So it's got one hand on the gamma phosphate. The Walker B motif 
is holding on to magnesium. So what type of amino acids would you think would be located in the Walker B motif? Acidic, negatively charged. Okay, so it's going to hold on to that magnesium. And the magnesium is holding on to the alpha and beta phosphates. And then when it's told to go into its proper conformation, it's going to go like that. And that's how it splits ATP. It's the Walker A and Walker B grabbing and pulling, exerting pressure, deep, uh, it deforms that gamma phosphate bond and breaks it. Okay. So that's, the, that's why that little sequence is important. <coughs> okay. Now, that doesn't tell you about the function. So even in normal people, um, you express MDR1 because you, you are exposed to a broad variety of nasty things that come in through your diet. And so you have mechanisms to get rid of the nasty stuff. And that's the job of MDR1, multi-drug resistance protein number one. So the way this works is there's the two transmembrane domains, there's the two nucleotide binding domains, and in the so-called open conformation, in other words, it's not doing anything, ATP, this is our rule, ATP is loosely bound to both nucleotide binding domains. So that's the starting point. It's called the open conformation. All right. That actually means that this drug binding site is open and available. Now, what happens is a lot of drugs are um, hydrophobic. They tend to be really nasty looking things. And the reason the drug companies make them hydrophobic is because they want it to go into your bloodstream. Okay, so this drug comes in here and it's actually going to partition, diffuse through the plasma membrane. But before it can leave, so this is the exoplasmic leaflet, it diffuses through that. It gets into the cytoplasmic leaflet, and before it can go into your cell and do something nasty to you, this thing vacuums it up. Okay, it will actually bind in the open conf um, configuration, sorry, open configuration to the, new, the, the drug binding site. That informs this thing to turn on. What it does is it both of those nucleotide binding domains rotate. They rotate like this, and they form a catalytic site around one of the two ATPs, and then they split it. Okay? So what causes this conformational change is the drug binding to these this binding site in the transmembrane domain. It splits ATP, and it is the release of the phosphate that ejects the drug back into the bloodstream. So we call this an efflux pump, because nasty stuff that's trying to get into your cells is effluxed back out. <coughs> and a lot of these proteins are located in your intestine, so you eat weird stuff all the time, and so instead of that going into your bloodstream, this keeps ejecting it back into the lumen until it's eliminated. Okay. They're in the, the liver. The liver's Where does the liver secrete all that stuff? Into bile, which goes into your gut, which is expelled. Okay. There's a lot of these pumps that sit on the blood-brain barrier. Because the last thing you need is for nasty drugs to get into your brain. And so these things are a barrier to prevent nasty stuff from going in. So it's a very important uh, way of protecting you from chemicals. Now, the problem is, if you're a cancer patient, you're being given nasty chemicals to do what? Kill cancer, okay? So, regular non-targeted chemotherapy is designed to kill all dividing cells, which tend to be the cancer cells, but there's also, the normal ones are also killed. So that's why we want to develop targeted modalities for treating cancer. The problem is, the cancer cell is sneaky, and so it will express all of these different ABC transporters. Not just one. One of the ones that are highly overexpressed is MDR1. And this one's expressed and that one's expressed. So if you express this, that patient is resistant to chemotherapy and they're, they're going to be, they're going to die because there's no way to defeat this. Well, we're working on drugs to do it. There's different problems with that, but um, this is that very dangerous pump for your, the tumor in a patient to be expressing. So what happens is the chemotherapy drug like, uh, like this, the, it's labeled D here, 
Okay, so it tries to get in, and it's going to usually mess with the DNA, break it up, and kill the cell. But if you if these pumps keep extruding it, the concentration of that drug never gets high enough to kill the tumor cell, and so that's why it survives. Now, what's really bad is you go, oh well, I'll switch chemotherapy agents. I'll go from say Taxol to Cisplatin, which is a platinum drug. The problem is, is this guy right here in particular. It has, it's unlike all the rest of the pumps, which are extremely specific. This thing is the slut of the pump world. It will, if it's there, it will pump out steroids, aspirin, whatever you give it. So that person that has cancer is resistant not only to this drug, but to all other drugs. And that's what's called multi-drug resistance, and that's why it's the target of a lot of study. And actually, uh, Ina Erbach, who works over, she's actually a member of that, that membrane protein group, and that's one of the reasons she's spent a lot of time. This is her diagram, and this is her mechanism that she came up with for describing that pump. So we know a lot about it. Okay. Any questions about that pump? We didn't get to the SGLT1, but we'll... Dr. Ernest Wright will talk about it, and then we will talk about it on Thursday. Okay. Magnesium holds on to the alpha and beta phosphates. So it's really getting two hands on it. Okay. All right. Thanks.